Melanie St. James here, back with Empowerment Works Pulse of the Movement. As we continue to explore human security, we may be feeling a little more at home or at peace with our Muslim American neighbors. However, many people in the United States are still very concerned about immigration and possible threats that Muslim or other immigrants might be having on human security in the USA, particularly around terrorist attacks. To help understand some of these issues better, we are absolutely privileged to welcome internationally recognized best-selling author Robert Young Pelton. Robert has a storied career of traveling to the world's most dangerous places and meeting with some of their most dangerous people. Often on both sides of the war issues with different armies, he seems to be the last one standing. His most recent books include License to Kill, Hired Guns in the War on Terror, a book about mercenaries and private contractors, and Raven, a YA story based on his early childhood. He has been a frequent media contributor and is internationally recognized as the guy who can find anyone anywhere. In recent years, however, he has been working on a different type of dangerous mission helping those migrants who are at peril as they cross deadly water routes from conflict areas to the relative safety of Europe. Robert, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So Robert, with all of your adventures in dangerous places as an author and a war journalist, what are you working on now? My background uh, actually was in marketing and uh, I was uh, paid a lot of money to develop products and understand uh, social change and what people wanted. And around the age of 40, I, I retired and I ended up spending my time focusing on conflict. So I went inside most of the dirty wars uh, so far about, I don't know, two or three dozen. And then I was most recently in CERT Libya, for example, uh, in the fight against ISIS. And what happens is when you spend a lot of time in warfare, you notice that it affects civilians. And uh, I've chosen certain subjects. So originally I was focused on jihadis and, and uh, these uh, Islamic fundamentalist wars. I then focused on proxy wars with mercenaries and contractors. And then now I'm focused on essentially uh, displacement. And right now it's probably the biggest single problem uh, that we face and other nations face is how to deal with 65 million people who are no longer in their homes. Mm -hmm. And these people have a variety of reasons for leaving their homes, but a lot of the, the impetus is that we've had these wars that have gone on for 15 years and obviously some even longer, which don't have resolutions, which keeps people out of their countries and also forces more and more people out of their countries. But when they leave their countries, they go into another country. So, Everybody from Europe to America to Latin America is dealing with the influx of, of people that they didn't invite into their country and how that affects their culture and their security and their national structure. What drew you to helping migrants? What is it that took you back out to risk your life in these rescues? The basic problem is that humans normally migrate either on a daily basis or weekly or monthly basis, but they have stability. and with the rise of the city-state and the borders and the idea that continents now have imaginary lines that you can't cross because it's controlled by another government. Um, we're now getting back to the period of time in which people just moved. They had no reason to obey laws or borders. They simply didn't want to stay in one place and they went to another place. And of course, Europe was probably the most affected by this. But uh, people have migrated throughout history. So we're getting back to a period where we're suddenly realizing that human beings don't necessarily need permission to move across continents. And with all of your experience, what are you seeing as some of the biggest issues, challenges, and possible solutions in human migration today? The biggest single problem is dealing with both the positive and negative effects of migration at the same time. You know, if you look at the United States, we have massive populations of what you would call illegal immigrants or undocumented aliens. 
and most of these people are integrated into the social system. They work at jobs, uh, they do whatever they do, and they, and they don't necessarily cause problems or upheavals. And then you also have people who come in specifically to commit crimes and use the, the porous borders to, to do something here and then go back to a different country. So it's hard to have that duality when you're a politician because obviously people that already live in a country are going to say, keep those people out, they're going to steal my job, they're going to rob banks, they're going to do whatever. And yet those same people will use those people to, to cut their grass or to clean their toilets or to fix their wallpaper or their house. So what you see all around the world is that migrants actually flow into economic opportunity unless they're artificially held in camps. And you see these outside of Somalia where, you, for example, Dadaab had a population, I think at its peak of almost a million people pulling people out of the economy and destroying Somalia. So just to recap is, is if we can view migration as a reality, in other words, it's happening whether we want it to happen or not, and that there are both positive and negative effects of that. When you say solutions, the migrants and the organizations that move migrants don't care about solutions. And this is one of the things that I think perplexes Europe and America. The, you know, I run ground networks in Libya and I track human smugglers and I look at the economics involved and how they operate. And you have to remember that they make more money than the border control people do. So the, the concept of smuggling and going across borders is a much bigger business than the government effort to keep those people out. You hear a lot about building walls. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Palestine or if you go to Mexico, you'll suddenly notice there's these huge tunnels with railroad tracks and lighting and air conditioning. <laughs> so one of the things that we have to be is very pragmatic about arbitrary decisions that don't necessarily fix anything that just create another methodology for people and goods to come into a country. Mm -hmm. And and this is what I see the, the biggest failing right now is, is a pragmatic approach as opposed to a, a simplistic approach. People, particularly white people, like the idea of walls and moats. Mm -hmm. They figure if they build a moat like the Mediterranean or the Atlantic, people won't get across. And if they build a wall, uh, people won't be able to climb over. And it's, it's, it's a very simplistic idea that came from the 12th century or probably before that you hear over and over again in modern politics. Mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't work. Now, the other one is incarceration. Basically, grab all these people and put them in camps and, and don't let them go anywhere. Uh, you're talking about millions and millions of people, and, and it's not going to work. So, once yeah. again, a pragmatic approach, which is accepting that th this flow exists whether you try to stop it or not, like water, how you integrate those people, for better or worse, into your society and deal with them. So as you know, Europe is facing a huge refugee crisis well beyond what we're seeing in the U.S. And these migrant populations are being blamed for a lot of Europe's crime problems and terrorist activities. What are you seeing in working with these communities? Is that true? What are you seeing as far as their integration? We're talking about the hundreds, in the hundreds of thousands, people coming across, let's say, the Mediterranean or going into Europe. And, and my experience has basically been in the prisons in Libya and uh, with the smugglers and also with the NGOs that are at sea rescuing these people and then on land in Europe talking to these people. So I've had a very diverse exposure to uh, migrants and immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. And the one commonality you hear is that they are leaving something that they don't feel is sustainable and they're moving to something else that they think is better. Both parts of that equation are kind of fuzzy. In other words, they don't quite know what they're going to do when they get to Europe or America, and they don't quite know how to fix uh, from where they came back. But what they do is they expose themselves to a human trafficking network, which they voluntarily pay money to. They, they know the horrors. They've got the internet. They, they've seen the documentaries and the news reports. And they go into this stream, which takes them across the desert, takes them into camps where they're abused and, and fleeced out of their money. It takes them to Libya where they're hunted down and kidnapped. And after the last dollar has been squeezed out of them and their families, uh, they get on these boats. And then when they get on these boats, they know they're not going to make it all the way to Europe. So 
they hope that somebody sees them and then pulls them off the boats and they hope they don't drown within minutes of heading out to sea. And then when they get on land, they communicate with their diaspora and they find a house, a place to stay. So the stories I've heard are, are both horrific and uplifting. So typical stories of people being, you know, brutalized and raped and murdered in jail and then people getting to Europe and being extremely depressed that they're, they're no longer valued as a human being because they're a migrant. You know, there's someone that is unwanted, almost like an infestation, you know, that, that people don't want. And they realize that they had a certain sense of status in society back home. You know, they had brothers and sisters and people knew who they were. And they stripped that away when they come to Europe. So I'm actually working on a film right now that I'm directing, which is a 90 minute film about what it's like to go from your home to Europe and what it's like to take these sea voyages and be put in jail. And I've interviewed lots of smugglers who tell very kind of simple but brutal stories about how they deal with these people. I talk to the migrants who sometimes are terribly depressed when they get to Europe. And part of that is, is almost like PTSD. Can you imagine being a doctor in Syria and having a practice and a beautiful home and suddenly a barrel bomb comes out of nowhere and bang, you're homeless. And when you try to apply to Europe, well, why wouldn't you accept a Syrian family who's educated and affluent? And suddenly he realizes that he's nobody. So they end up having to pay smugglers to get them to Europe and rebuild their lives. Now, they don't want to live in Europe forever. They want to go back to Syria, but they can't go to Syria. So you have a lot of these very sad stories where public opinion is, has turned against them because of the numbers, not because of the individuals. And at the same time, I've met a lot of really stupid people that came from small towns in Africa that just decided, hey, I'm going to go to Europe, you know, and get a job and become a soccer player and eat pizza and and, and you bet the mind boggles, but then you think there's nothing for them in Gambia or Southern Nigeria and everybody's going to Europe anyways. Sometimes it's cheaper to take a smuggling trip to Europe than it is to fly to Europe. So, I mean, there, there is a huge river of, of, of people. Each one has their own stories. Yeah. Historically, it's not always been Muslims. It was the Japanese. It was McCarthyism. It seems that somebody is always being singled out. If it weren't the Muslims, maybe it'd be another group, right? What do you think? Keep in mind that this is fairly typical. You remember when Jewish refugees tried to come here in World War II, we didn't want them. There were actually a number of Jewish children on boats that were refused entry into ports. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had the same problem over and over. It was the Irish, you know? It was the, you name it. The, yeah. Whatever the next wave is, is considered to be below standards and not wanted and whatever, and then suddenly they slowly become integrated. So this is what you're seeing in Europe, where people are being faced with thousands and thousands of people who they sort of have a blanket judgment on. Each one of these groups has their negative and positive. So you've got the, mm. you know, you remember you had the Italian mafia, the Jewish mafia, the Irish mafia, you have the Mexican mafia, and then you also have the brilliant uh, scientists, you know, so you, you can't, we, we can't judge them as one homogeneous pile of people. We have to say that there are good and bad in each one of these groups. So. Wow, so it's pretty clear that the vast, vast majority of migrants are simply escaping an unlivable situation and trying to protect their families and looking for a better life, the American dream, right? However, how would you mitigate the risk posed by the few who would be considered legitimate security threats? What can be done to prevent that? Well, the first step is to understand who's who. So don't lump them all into one big basket and call them migrants. You know, look at people's reasons, motivations, educational background. Um, I, I know from the most basic human emotions that people are different. So a boatload of Nigerians is going to react differently than a boatload of Eritreans. Uh, but even within each one of those boats, everybody has a different story. So. Mm -hmm. The numbers tend to overwhelm us, and we go, wow, there's 400 Eritreans, there's 3,000 Nigerians, there's 600 Syrians, there's 500 Bangladeshis, and, and we don't let them create their own little societal structures and say, okay, who amongst you is, is going to take charge? Who can handle this? Who in your group 
are you suspicious of, things like that. We tend to just lump them all as, as migrants. And I guess we legally have to, you know, we, we, we deal with them as human beings, so we can't really sort of uh, separate them or socialize them. In Libya, for example, they separate people by their national origins because they say the Nigerians are very violent and they cause riots and they always fight. And the Eritreans are very nice and they're calm. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre world to go there. Mm. But what I'm saying is that when they come to Europe and America, we tend to just make them all the same, which means we tend to suspect them all. Mm. You know, in other words, we, we ask questions like, well, are there terrorists coming to Europe? And it's like, yeah, of course there are, you know, but well, where are they? And it's like, well, all you have to do is ask. I mean, the people on the boat know if somebody's suspicious or he came from a certain place. And, and my point is we have all the tools we need. We just don't apply them because on one side we're like, Oh, we can't judge these people. They're coming in as, as refugees. We can't really separate them out and, and ask what their motivations are. On the other hand, we know that within any large number of people, there are going to be people who are tend to either criminality, violence or, or something else. So, common sense actually should dictate <laughs> what we do. We, we don't have time to sit there and talk to a million migrants about what they think. I mean, what you do is you empower the migrants to build their own social structures. So here, mm -hmm. here's, a, here's a case in point. You know, when, when 100,000 Muslims come to a certain area, you build mosques for them. You build madrasas. You, you build things that allow them to create social centers, and then you promote people who are calm, respected elders to figure out who's who and what's what and you let that society repress the violent actors or police themselves um, what we tend to do is not want to engage them at that level so guess yeah. what terrorist groups do? guess what extremists do they create those social centers whether it's online or whether it's physical meetings and they energize them to be angry against whatever they're angry against and then this is the problem is that we don't engage and this is one of the topics that is brought up over and over again is are terrorists coming to Europe and I keep saying well I've been on this boat I rescued these people I didn't see any tourists but I can tell you this much the terrorists are already in Europe in other words there's more members of ISIS inside Europe than there are in some uh, other countries and these people are recruited they're motivated they're turned into terrorists it doesn't matter their place of origin. And actually one of the least likely areas to find a terrorist is in, a, in, the, in, in the flow of migrants. But it's also one of the more sensitive areas once they get to a region and they're sort of demonized or ignored or impoverished, that these people very much can turn towards a violent solution if they're not engaged intelligently. And this is the key to understanding terrorism and migration, that most of the terrorists initially came from refugee camps. In other words, in, in Afghanistan, when we started pumping billions of dollars uh, into fighting the Soviets, we recruited people out of the refugee camps in Pakistan to go back in and fight inside Afghanistan. So places like Myanmar, where you have the Rohingyas, who are not, who are not terrorists, who are not aligned, they're, they're, they're Muslims, but they're not aligned with any sort of terrorist groups or violent groups, are literally being beaten, burned, attacked, raped. Now these people at some point are going to fight back. Mm. And, and if we're not offering them an option, then sometimes terrorist groups will. So before 9-11, a friend of mine who was trained in the camps in, by bin Laden was working with the FBI to point out criminal elements and fingered Hani Hanjour to the Arizona FBI. Now Hani Hanjour was one of the hijackers. Um, Almost the entire number of hijackers were actually identified by either flight schools, by various mm -hmm. law enforcement and communities as being odd, like up to something. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't act because we thought a terrorist was a white ex-military person because of Oklahoma, because of the Oklahoma bombings. We thought they were all militia members, so we weren't focused on Islamic terrorists. Now we obsess with Islamic terrorists. <laughs> and once again, these communities have a way of policing themselves. They can tell you if somebody doesn't fit in, if somebody went to Pakistan for training, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just saying that we have to put some of this burden on the communities of immigrants and we have to listen to them when they say, this guy's not a terrorist, he's just angry and he's, you know, whatever. So fine, you know, let him go. But we, we are developing a level of intolerance and fear 
caused by insider attacks, which are exactly created to create that fear and that distrust amongst migrant communities. Robert, what are some of the causes of radicalization or terrorism for that matter? Even looking at the non-Islamic attacks such as Columbine, do you see a common thread such as isolation of the perpetrators or any other kind of social patterns? You know, for many, many years, I've told people that Al-Qaeda and ISIS and groups like that are essentially cults. They, they, they use some of the basics of seeking people who are not identifying with society, seeking people who are angry about something, alienating them, in other words, isolating them away from the mainstream, their family, and then teaching them basically the reverse Maslow hierarchy of needs. In other words, you want to die. You don't want to build a community. You don't want to be safe. And then unleashing those people back on normal society. And when you put people, for example, in refugee camps or prisons or places where they're closely connected and they're all angry and they're not part of society, it is absolutely normal for uh, antisocial behavior to be taught and absorbed and, and passed along. And... I'm not saying that America does that, but you can imagine Gitmo, for example, where you had a number of people who were there for a variety of reasons, none of them charged with a crime, but all forming an association, uh, almost like an alumni, uh, that then go back and share whatever they feel with other angry people in, in their communities. And uh, these are all perfect examples of not integrating people into society, or at least not attempting to, and if they are criminals, not quickly returning them back to where they came from or dealing with them as criminals, but allowing them to live within a diaspora or a group. So in order to help migrants integrate, both into their new countries and communities, as well as into their own cultural centers, are there any solutions or ways to go about that? First step is to look at the the major reasons why these people are fleeing, right? We, we have wars in Afghanistan, in, in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, I mean, you name it, Somalia, that have gone on for years and years and years that have never been resolved. They've always been left at a certain state of instability. So as long as we tolerate that worldwide, people aren't going to be going back home to rebuild. So those solutions can range from extreme violence, as you saw with the Russians and Assad in Syria, uh, to more peaceful versions like you see in Somalia and Afghanistan where they're trying to integrate former, well, I, they weren't terrorist groups, but they're trying to integrate people like the Taliban to come in towards the government, which at first sounds a little scary, but then you realize as soon as you have to fix a pothole and you have to get elected democratically, that tends to get rid of a lot of these insurgent and extremist groups. because they, they have to integrate into society. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we have to make it very clear to the EU and the U.S. governments that they have to deal with this migration. They can't pretend it's not happening. They can't hope that it goes away. I mean, the, the, there will always be hundreds of thousands of people trying to come to America, trying to come to Europe. So the faster we create programs to integrate them, whether it's guest worker programs or things that get them you know, working and, and on their own feet, the faster we can judge them as whether they are integrating quickly or slowly, but at least we have to give them a chance. And the yeah. third thing is that we have to be able to judge people we don't want in the country. So if we feel that there are a plethora of economic migrants who are just choking up the system, then we also have to be a little rude and brutal and say, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, you jumped across the fence, but we're going to have to put you back to the country where you came from. And that tends to discourage a lot of economic migrants. Now, strangely enough, you know, I'm a migrant. I, I came from Canada. I migrated to the U.S. Um, and I see, I look around me in California, and I see thousands of undocumented people working here. It doesn't bother me that much if they're integrated into society, but we don't allow them to integrate into society because we have these sort of very hard rules that, okay, you broke the law, so you have to go back to Mexico or El Salvador or whatever. Um, but yet they're already here and they're working and they're sending their money back to their families, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I would advocate a more liberalized approach to people who have shown that they can integrate and then a tougher approach to people who show that they can integrate.
And these would be criminals that you see being sent over and people that are abusing the border system. So I think there's a lot of solutions if we just accept the fact that this is going to be part of our future for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's an open border movement that says that these colonial era borders and these old city state borders are obsolete. And, and you see a movement in Europe to create a larger economic zone. I mean, you've seen how America has flourished because we don't have to go through checkpoints through every state. Uh, mm -hmm. Should there be a border between Canada and the U.S.? Probably not. You know, the, the, so there, there are people that are pushing for open borders, and at the same time, there are people who are pushing for tighter controls because they're, they're fearful of other people. Right. And right. I'm not a politician, so I don't care, but the point is that <laughs> the more we look at actual migrants and more we analyze how they contribute financially and economically, and the more we put them on the tax-paying rolls and the more we integrate them into society, the quicker we're going to be a smart country as opposed to sort of an 18th century country. So that's what I see happening is we live in a global environment. Yeah, we communicate globally. We should think globally. Okay, so I'm understanding that it's not only important for these migrants to integrate into the cultures of where they're landing, but also into their own cultures so that they can be seen and respected and live healthy lives and get jobs and have a community. Are there any solutions or ways that that can be done more effectively that you can recommend? First step is to look at the, the major reasons why these people are fleeing, right? We, we have wars in Afghanistan and in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, I mean, you name it, Somalia, that have gone on for years and years and years that have never been resolved. They've always been left at a certain state of instability. So as long as we tolerate that worldwide, people aren't going to be going back home to rebuild. So those solutions can range from extreme violence, as you saw with the Russians and Assad in Syria, uh, to more peaceful versions like you see in Somalia and Afghanistan, where they're trying to integrate former, well, I, they weren't terrorist groups, but they're trying to integrate people like the Taliban to come in towards the government, which at first sounds a little scary, but then you realize as soon as you have to fix a pothole and you have to get elected democratically that tends to get rid of a lot of these insurgent and extremist groups because they, they have to integrate it into society. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we have to make it very clear to the EU and the US governments that they have to deal with this migration. They can't pretend it's not happening. They can't hope that it goes away. I mean, the, the, there will always be hundreds of thousands of people trying to come to America, trying to come to Europe. So the faster we create programs to integrate them, whether it's guest worker programs or things that get them you know, working and, and on their own feet, the faster we can judge them as whether they are integrating quickly or slowly, but at least we have to give them a chance. And the yeah. third thing is that we have to be able to judge people we don't want in the country. So if we feel that there are a plethora of economic migrants who are just choking up the system, then we also have to be a little rude and brutal and say, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, you jumped across the fence, but we're going to have to put you back to the country where you came from. And that tends to discourage a lot of economic migrants. Now, strangely enough, you know, I'm a migrant. I, I came from Canada. I migrated to the U S um, and I see, I look around me in California and I see thousands of undocumented people working here doesn't bother me that much if they're integrated into society, but we don't allow them to integrate into society because we have these sort of very hard rules that, okay, you broke the law, so you have to go back to Mexico or El Salvador or whatever. Um, but yet they're already here and they're working and they're sending their money back to their families, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I would advocate a more liberalized approach to people who have shown that they can integrate and then a tougher approach to people who show is that they can integrate. And these would be criminals that you see being sent over and people that are abusing the border system. So I think there's a lot of solutions if we just accept the fact that this is going to be part of our future for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's an open border movement that says that these colonial era borders and these old city state borders are obsolete. And, and you see a movement in Europe to create a larger economic zone. I mean, you've seen how America has flourished because we don't have to go through checkpoints through every state. 
Uh, should there be a border between Canada and the U.S.? Probably not. You know, the, the, so there, there are people that are pushing for open borders, and at the same time, there are people who are pushing for tighter controls because they're they're fearful of other people. Right. And right. I'm not a politician, so I don't care. But the point is that <laughs> the more we look at actual migrants and more we analyze how they contribute financially and economically. And the more we put them on the tax paying roles and the more we integrate them into society, the quicker we're going to be a smart country as opposed to sort of an 18th century country. So that's what I see happening is we live in a global environment. Yeah, we communicate globally. We should think globally. Robert, this is such valuable information and I have so many takeaways already. And to add to that, one of the most important things we're doing with this broadcast is giving people a call to action. What is something that people watching back at home can do to address these issues? Well, I'm not a social activist, but I'll say this is that we, we are trending towards very simplistic problems and uh, solutions to very complex problems, and they don't always work out that way. So. Uh, what I would suggest people do is talk to somebody who came from somewhere else and listen to their story. And it's probably not that much different from the next guy that's going to come from somewhere else. We all eventually settle down and get on with our lives. And uh, migration is the biggest single problem on earth right now. It's not hunger. It's not war. It's the fact that we're displacing mass amounts of people which forces everybody everywhere to deal with how, how we solve this problem. So I don't, I don't have any call to action other than talk to a migrant, figure out what his problems are, be a little smarter when people have discussions. And when somebody says, let's build a wall, just say, hey, have you ever seen these tunnels that go under the, <laughs> under the Mexican border? <laughs> and, and, and start knocking down some of that sort of simplistic uh, jingoism. And by the way, a lot of these people are, are happy to go home. It's not like we're, we're tied to the ground. You know, we, move, we all move everywhere all the time. So it's, it's not like people have to sit in one spot once they behave themselves. Uh, they should be able to go back to where they came from and visit their family. So it's, anyways, it's, it's, it's get, get, get deeper into the problem and see some of the, the solutions that are out there. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining us. Your human perspective is vital for everyone to understand. And this has been incredibly human. Thank you very much. And everyone back home, if you want to learn more about Robert, check out his autobiography, The Adventurist. You can find a link to that in his website, Come Back Alive on empowermentworks.org forward slash POM, along with all kinds of calls to action and links to the latest petitions and things that you can do. And don't miss another episode. You can see what's happening next there. And be sure to subscribe to Empowerment Works TV right here. We also have a dialogue going on on this video. So please chime in, let us know what you're thinking, what is going on in your world. Tell us your stories. Your voice matters. Be part of the movement. See you next time. Thank you.